Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, so I will be talking about EU citizens, but not in, I'll be talking about their despair and their anger and their um, mobilization. That's what I want to talk about today. Um, so this paper um, follows from an, another paper that I wrote. Um, and that paper, which will give you a sense, the title of that paper, which will give you a sense of where I'm coming from, is called The EU's Great Attack on Social Europe in the Eurozone Crisis. And this paper is called Mobilizing Against the EU's Great Attack on Social Europe in the Eurozone Crisis. So it's building on uh, some things uh, I've been working on. So as I guess you've <laughs> partially guessed, I'm interested in contestation. And I want to talk about locations of contestation, modes of contestation, and I guess I'll be looking at some of what Claudia has called the hotspots of uh, contestation in the Eurozone crisis. And if I'm very lucky, I'll get to the point where I'll be able to tell you that my Portuguese reading skills are not what I thought they were. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so time permitting, I want to look at three, three things very briefly. The first one is why transnational civil society is not where EU scholars said it was. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to look at are legal constraints and legal choices about mobilization in the Eurozone crisis. And finally, I want to have a look at who is mobilizing against the Eurozone crisis and how, insofar that, as that has not already been covered. So first, and um, as briefly as I, as I can, why transnational civil society is not where EU scholars have often assumed. So here, to try and uh, be concise, I'm going to take one recent, and I think not at all unrepresentative example of the literature, and this is Rachel Tchaikovsky's 2007 book on European Court and Civil Society, Litigation, Mobilization, and Governance. Now, she argues in this book that over time, transnational mobilization has changed in Europe. So instead of having individual activists or informal groupings, over time it's become more collective, more transnational in highly organized campaigns and organizations, what she calls a true transnational civil society. Once mobilized, these groups have systematically impacted EU governance. And this for her is exemplified by the EU civil society contact group, look at their website called Act for Europe. And she sees this as a perfect example of high, yeah, highly institutionalized and collective EU civil society mobilization became by the mid 2000s. So, she says, look, they were all brought together to participate in the constitutional treaty process. Um, and so she argues that by the early 2000s, civil society, as represented in particular through the environmental and women's movements, were a permanent and influential in the development and enforcement of relevant EU law. So my simple question, <laughs> looking at this literature, was how has that all been going since the Eurozone crisis began? How has the European Women's Lobby, a star of her book, a star example of transnational civil society, been responding, for example, to the great attack on Greek women in the Eurozone crisis, which has been carefully and fully documented by the International Labour Organization? So I go on their website, <laughs> and what do I find uh, relating to the Eurozone crisis? Absolutely nothing. Uh, absolutely nothing. Now, so I thought, well, maybe a bad example. Let me go and look somewhere else. Surely the European Anti-Poverty Network is going to have something to say about the slashing of social benefits, jobs, minimum wages over the last three years. Now, when I looked at two weeks ago, nothing. But sadly, they, <laughs> they ruined my argument by yesterday putting something on the website saying, <laughs> saying, <laughs> that they held their executive committee meeting in Athens as an act of solidarity. And the content of that meeting was to talk about the EU budget. So 
anyway, the point here is simply, let's not call this transnational civil society. This is a complete misnomer. Instead, it's some kind of special part of the EU policy making fabric, and uh, that's all it is. So if we want to look for transnational civil society in Europe, we need to look somewhere else. So this is a good demonstration of that uh, fact, I think. Secondly, mobilization, and here I'm going to be a bit more lawyerly, so, but then we'll become totally non-law at the end, so don't worry. So here I'm interested in legal constraints and legal choices in terms of contesting the Eurozone crisis. I want to give an example of a legal constraint. We can see Eurozone law constraining mobilization and full democratic debate by looking at the position of Irish trade unions in the referendum held in Ireland on the European Stability Mechanism on the 31st of May this year. Now, what is the legal constraint on democratic um, debate? It is that payouts under the European Stability Mechanism are made subject, as I'm sure you know, to ratification of the Fiscal Compact Treaty and national implementation of its balanced budget rule. Now, while no Irish Union was in favour of the, of the treaty, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions felt compelled, and this was very much reported and talked about in the press, unlike in the referenda on the EU Nice and Lisbon treaties, not to take a position. They felt they were unable to take a position in this debate because they were fearful that their country could be denied access to the European stability mechanism if the treaty was rejected. So I see this as a very powerful example of Eurozone law closing down dem an important um, democratic debate. Now, the more positive side of law, here I want to look at choices about fundamental social rights mobilization to try and uh, call some of these choices, the EU's choices, to account. And I want to look very briefly, probably more briefly than I, than I should, um, at three alternative fundamental social rights routes which have been taken so far to challenging the EU authored attack on social rights in the bailout states. So the three are the International Labour Organization, the Council of Europe and the EU. And in a way, all of this, as I think someone said, Helen, is where everything is changing very rapidly. And in fact, all these things have just reached a critical juncture, I would say, because we're really now starting to get important decisions on compliance with fundamental social rights in the Eurozone crisis. So this is an interesting moment. Now, the main lesson I draw from looking at fundamental social rights mobilization is that, firstly, it has proved vital to have non-national and non-EU fundamental social rights organs to turn to. You need it somewhere outside the EU. Um, but that, secondly, precisely because of this potential weakness of the EU, it's very important that the EU is also asked about compliance with fundamental social rights in the crisis. So, International Labour Organization. Now, this is a story of the Greeks, right? All this part is a story of the Greeks, um, who were very active in turning outside the EU very quickly to other fundamental social rights organizations to ask for support and, um, and condemnation of what was happening in Greece. So in July 2010, shortly after the first Greek bailout had been agreed, the General Confederation of Greek Workers filed urgent observations with the ILO Committee of Experts on the application of conventions and recommendations for non-observance by Greece of 11 ILO conventions, including some core ILO, core labor rights. The ILO had a look at Greece and they said, oh my God, <laughs> so they said, please, we need, this is so big, so pervasive, so complex, we need to send a high level mission to Greece before we can work out our position in relation to core labor rights. And this mission 
uh, the high-level mission visited Greece from the 19th to the 23rd of September 2011. This visit exceptionally extended its mandate in order to visit the IMF and relevant EU institutions, and it produced a 70-page report which is really worth reading. Um, following from that report, last week, the Central ILO Committee on Core Collective Labour Rights, the Committee on Freedom of Association, gave its views on these Greek complaints in light of the high-level mission report and further information gathering. And basically, it says, right, we're going to keep this situation under review, but it warns Greece, looking at its previous well-established jurisprudence on what is permissible in times of economic crisis and stabilization, that Greece in many areas is sailing incredibly close to the wind, and in certain areas has definitely crossed the line of breaching core labor rights protected by international human rights law. So that's the ILO. The other fundamental social rights location targeted very rapidly by Greek civil society has been the Council of Europe and more specifically the European Social Charter System. How am I doing? Uh, seven oh, excellent. <laughs> so, the European Social Charter, as many of you will know, operates through a twin-track uh, procedure. One is a reporting system where the states have to send in reports and then the committee examines and uh, gives its conclusions. But the other is a collective complaints procedure. Uh, all three Eurozone bailout states have accepted the collective complaints procedure. And this has opened up important complementarities between the reporting system and the collective complaints procedure. So while the latest report for Greece concludes in June 2008, and therefore is of very little interest um, so far, no fewer than seven collective complaints have been lodged with the European Committee of Social Rights since January 2011. Now, five of these complaints concern cuts to Greek pensions and are clearly part of a coordinated strategy by several different sectoral pension organizations in Greece. And the other two complaints, which have now been decided and the results made uh, public very recently, concern employment and labor rights violations in Greece um, as a result of the bailout documents. And these complaints constitute really very precious resources, I think, for understanding more precisely the legal and political context in which labor rights were drastically altered. And I think it's a real bonus that the European Committee of Social Rights is a decision maker on these, uh, on these issues. Why? It has a much deeper, more testing and better established fundamental social rights jurisprudence than the EU. But much more importantly, it has the critical advantage over the Court of Justice and its EU Charter of Fundamental Rights of institutional distance and autonomy. And it has set this out in a very interesting decision in 2009. In the first decision, um, its first decision on one of these complaints, the committee makes very important general observations on crisis complaints. To what extent can you depart from fundamental social rights in times of crisis? Um, I'm not going to go into that. In the second, I'm just going to give you one example of a breach by Greece in the crisis rather than go through them all. It found that pay levels set by successive laws in 2010 and 2012 in Greece for people under 25 automatically, and this is quite rare, automatically breached the fair remuneration provisions in the charter as they provided for a wage for those young people, a wage that was below the Greek poverty line. That is to say, less than 50% of the average Greek wage. So what's interesting here then is a choice Greek civil society has turned not towards the EU, but towards the ILO and the Council of Europe in order to challenge what the EU is doing. Now, could this be because the Court of Justice's record 
especially the integrationist bent it has been accused of in using fundamental rights in the past, makes the Greeks not very confident that it would be prepared to take a robust stance on the compatibility of the bailout with EU fundamental social rights. But it's precisely that doubt, that very important doubt, that makes us very grateful to the Portuguese uh, who have made a preliminary reference on the compatibility of the labor, as of labor aspects uh, in port of the Portuguese bailout with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, this preliminary reference from the Oporto Tribunal asks whether a two-month salary cut for public servants in Portugal breaches various provisions of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Most centrally, Article 31.1 of the Charter, which says, every worker has the right to working conditions which respect his or her health, safety, and dignity. And I must say, nearly all the, reference, the questions are geared around the dignity question, which I think is also very interesting. So I think I just can't wait for this decision because this will be a true test of the Charter of Fundamental Rights social value as well as of the Court of Justice's commitment to social Europe. I see Miguel already laughing, but it's Portugal. <laughs> so finally, and very, very quickly, am I up? Two minutes. Who is mobilizing and how? And here I want to say thanks to lots of uh, researchers in the law department who've been gathering documents for me. Um, I still need to find out more, but some interesting things we can note. Very variable mobilization. So for example, in some countries, Latvia, Ireland, there has been very, very little public mobilization against the bailout measures. Whereas in the three Southern European bailout countries, people are certainly responding in very many public ways to the social crisis and its effects on them. Modes of mobilization. One important uh, and indeed sadly effective mode of mobilization, which I won't talk about more now, is suicide. And this has recently had a major impact on the eviction law in Spain over the last few weeks. Secondly, strikes and demonstrations allied with national legal initiatives, including constitutional litigation. And here there's a very interesting example from Portugal. Indeed, the Portuguese Constitutional Court has already struck down the law that has been referred to the Luxembourg Court in July this year on constitutional grounds, but with a weird retroactivity limitation. Um, and there are really many things to say here. I mean, on the 15th of September 20 this year, um, there was a huge mass public demonstration in over 30 Portuguese cities, and this was the largest mass mobilization in Portugal since the revolution in 1974. So important things are happening. Finally, last but not least, signs of genuine transnational mobilization. Not the uh, ERSATS version I talked about at the beginning, but real stuff. So 14th of November 2012, we should see really as a day of firsts in Europe. First, we have a decision by the European Trade Union Confederation on the 17th of October 2012 for a large-scale mobilization to be held across Europe. This is the first time an e, uh, a European coordinated day of action entailed simultaneous strikes in four different countries. It was the first ever Iberian Peninsula general strike. Over 9 million people went, in stri went on strike in Spain plus over two million others who simply fulfilled minimum service obligations, giving a participation rate of 76%. Um, and somebody talked this morning about 37,000 people taking a complaint to the German Constitutional Court. Well, what about, uh, <laughs> what about this? Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to stop there just to say, I think this is an incredibly interesting an important time for social contestation, but I have not found it easy to do this research because when you go on the ETUC website, you don't get all this detailed information. So I think this is an area really ripe for research for people interested in legal mobilization and democracy in the Eurozone crisis. So I want lots of other people to start writing papers like this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>